In your note, you say that the second half of 2012 will provide a template, a roadmap for how things will unfold in 2020 when it comes to uh, how asset prices will react. And the lesson there, the takeaway there is that the market can recover faster than economic data. So talk us through what that means in, say, FX. What would sure. be, what would you look for to happen in FX? Sure. All right, that's a great question. I think, first of all, let's remember what happened in 2012. The first half of 2012 was all about the Eurozone crisis having spread from Greece all the way to Italy. It was about to go France mm -hmm. until, guess what? You know, Draghi's famous, whatever it takes speech. And guess what? Overnight, you know, the Eurozone crisis went away and then the global economy mounted a synchronized recovery. And you know why? What's the biggest lesson for us now is that back then, the pent up demand in the system had been accumulating for months and months and months. And when they got released, all of a sudden, the world economy just sang. You know, let me put it this way. It's like a spring that was so compressed when you let it go, it bounced. I'm just telling you, right now it's the same thing. Every company that I've seen in the last six months, S&P 500 company, I've seen probably about 100 of them. Everybody's telling me, you know what, David? Business is great. Except if you want to know, we're really, really, really worried about the U.S. China trade war. Because they're saying this is like a huge cloud in the sky casting this massive shadow as a result because we're not in the business of deciphering political risk. We're all sitting on our hands doing nothing. We're pulling back capbacks and hiring. So I think if that uncertainty gets removed, I think companies are going to go back to restocking inventory. You're going to see people going back undertaking capbacks. I think that's going to be very... I even think China might even base these policy. Now, you're right. I think the way I look at this is very simple. If we go back to a reflationary world, the world's doing better, that's not going to be so kind for the U.S. dollar. Mm. Only because, you know what, I'm nothing against, I think the U.S. is doing great, except that, you know, we get a trade deal, it's going to be even better for the rest of the world than for the U.S. So okay. from a sort of FX pair standpoint, and you listed as one of your top trades, Aussie versus yen is kind of just the ultimate shift away from safety to cyclical. Exactly. Especially given the fact, why do you think the Chinese have been so reluctant to ease policy more aggressively? Because I really do believe that they think that they have very limited dry powder. Mm -hmm. Right now, with all the uncertainty around trade war, if they were to ease now, it would be a complete waste of ammunition. Once you have basically a deal, they ease, and I think Aussie dollar is going to do very well, especially given that, <laughs> you know, commodity prices definitely got plenty of room to reprice higher. So go back to the reflation comment that mm. you just made. I mean, help me believe in the reflation trade because, uh, I mean, the last 10 years would sort of argue mm -hmm. against it. Yeah. Listen, the fact is, you know, you know it's, to me, the most interesting about this economy right now is that the wages of the 10% lowest mm -hmm. income earners in this country is currently growing at the fastest rate in 10 years. That must tell you something mm -hmm. about how tight the labor market is. Okay, we know that basically oil has been equal. Probably core inflation is going to go back to 2% by probably the first quarter of next year. And by the way, the biggest problem with this whole ref I mean, we all assume it's a problem. The greatest, you know, I'll tell you the greatest support for reflation trades next year mm -hmm. is the fact the Fed just finished cutting rates. Mm -hmm. It will take them six months before they're going to think about hiking rates, by which time you're going to be talking about five months before the election. The economy will have to be growing at 10% for them to actually even talk about hiking rates next year. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you get a strong economy and the Fed being held back by the election, that's going to be highly reflationary. This is why I like owning U.S. inflation break evens. I think basically like tips are going to outperform next year because the Fed might actually end up being behind the curve. Mm. It might be in a position where it needs to think about raising rates. Well, the, but they won't be able to. <laughs> right. So talk a little bit about how this dovetails with the election. Come November 2020, mm. everything is, you know, at stake. What what needs to happen before then? And yeah. and how do you game sure. out what's going to happen in November? You know, you know, Scarlett, I think, I think it's, that's the most crucial question. But I would argue the outcome of the U.S.-China trade war and the outcome of the U.S. election next year will have a 90% correlation. Mm. Because if Trump managed to close this trade deal with China, I think the economy is going to do very well. And he's clearly going to be the man to beat. If, however, there is no trade deal with China, the stock market is going to go down. The economy is going to suffer. The North Koreans threaten to basically essentially be letting basically missiles fly. I'll tell you, then we go into recession, and then you might actually get country opting for a left-wing populist. 
And I think from that point, this is why the next three weeks, I would argue the next three weeks is going to be so important because the impact will be felt for probably many years to come. One thing we haven't had you expand on is USMCA. You think Pelosi is going to have to ratify it. Why is she going to have to, and what is the trade? What's the most sensitive right. Right. bet one can make on Excellent that ratification? Question. I'll tell you this. The Democrats have been telling us for the last two months that they can walk, chew gum, and impeach at the same time. Okay. You don't believe it? <laughs> no. Show us the good. If you, I mean, listen, passing USMCA will be a great piece of evidence that they can chew gum and walk at the same time. Moreover, Pelosi just said that she's, they're going to press ahead with getting a vote on the article's impeachment. Now, she's going to have, she's going to be thinking about how she's going to persuade the 31 House Democrats sitting in swing districts who could potentially, who might think that, you know what, voting for this thing may not do them any good in the election next year. Guess what? The best way to bribe them, I would argue, is USMCA. Because UCA, USMCA is a bipartisan piece of legislation, is one that I think is good, it's going to be good for America. The Democrats already got what they wanted, yeah. okay, from the Mexicans, even from the Canadians. They could basically make the case, we did this because it's good for the country, and therefore impeachment is not personal. David, we're running out of time. What's your best carry trade idea? I, I like the Mexican peso. Yeah. Because exactly for that reason, why do you think the Mexican economy is in a recession right now? Because the uncertainty around USMCA, direct foreign investment into Mexico this year has collapsed. This is why AMLO is so eager to bank, to basically bend forward, backward in order to make this work. And this is why I think this is going to get done.